So let's see if it works. No. So the G function GX is basically oops. No, it's too sensitive. I'll 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 fix it later. I'll go back. Sorry guys. So let's define a function GX. Let's say x squared. GX is a function of a random variable which could take any values between x1 and xn. Yeah? So the question is, what's the expected value of GX? What do you think? Did you have this before? Okay. Now, one way to do you could, you could think that why don't we then take all the values, plug them in there, estimate each one of them, and then calculate the average. That's probably the right way to do if you have the data. Now, if you're doing it conceptually, for the, you know, when, when you do what I just said, it's with a sample of data, right? But if, you, if you're on a, a population level, and conceptually, the way you do it is uh, the, the outcome is this. It's the sum of the values that function takes. It's, it, it, function usually has a range, yeah? Mm -hmm. Takes certain values in the mm -hmm. range. Times the associated probabilities of this, each x. So it's the same thing as, as the random variable idea behind the random variable, yeah? Makes sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So probability, sorry, probability of the xi times the value of function for that uh, uh, x random variable. So if x, um, x is, let's say, 3, then you calculate uh, g of 3 times it by obtain, probability of obtaining a 3. Makes sense? So if it's a dice, so I'm going to give short an example here. Oops. No, it's not visible to you. <laughs> Sorry. So that's that's what we have. I just had to do some writing there uh, to for you so that you distinguish between random variables realization x and then the uh, function of a random variable. The two things, two different things. Now let's assume that the, we have a, a, a function x squared which is y equals x squared or gx equals x squared, then the average value or expected value of that function is then, as I said, the function itself, squared. So the, each, each outcome is squared times the probability associated with each outcome. Now, you may have a function uh, b1, uh, sorry, 3 plus 4x, then obviously then you, you plug in the numbers into that function times them by the probabilities, yeah? So this could be sum of the function 3 plus 3xi three squared, close the brackets, times the probability of obtaining that x. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, here is an example of that uh, function, x squared. Do you know what the f uh, f graph of uh, x squared is? Parabola, yeah, right? The, the, the minimum is right zero, right on the zero on the x-axis and y-axis, yeah? So it's just a parabola. It looks like the expected value of this uh, function of a random variable is 54. Do I need to explain you this, how this worked? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same standard, or is it not clear? Yeah, it's the same standard procedure, yeah? So you have the random outcomes, the outcomes from the, from the roll bar. Uh, roll of dice and then the probabilities associated with each one and then function here is x squared it could be b uh, 3 plus 3x it could be x squared plus x 2x plus 4 so it can be any function so you calculate the value of each and then times them up that gives us the sum 
label the values here. Now, careful. Expected value of x squared is not the same as the, x, uh, the square of expected value of x. Yeah, it's not the same because this is a function, it's expected value, while this is the uh, expected value squared. Yeah, they are not equal things. This is where the confusion comes when we do a bit of conceptual, uh, theoretical part of econometrics next week. So they are the same things. The random variable takes a 7, but then the function of this random variable takes 54. Yeah? The expected value of the x squared, which is the function of that random variable, is 58. Sorry, 54. So they are the same. Yeah? Now, that, hopefully this is all clear, we now into the, uh, coming to the set of rules, which you probably need to memorize for the, lecture, uh, um, for, the, for the exam, because the formula sheet will not be given in the exam. At all. There's no formula other than these. <laughs> the, 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 so we have to prepare you such that you are able to do it without formulas. You know, we have to teach you in a way that, in the end, you are confident econometricians. Yeah? Okay. So don't worry, you'll be fine. <laughs> the, it's only today's lecture, I think, we do a bit of conceptual revision. But from next week onwards, it's more applications, mm -hmm. mix of it, that, 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 which, which is the fun part, I think. Now, expectations, uh, uh, operator rules. Expected value of the sum of random variables. Any number, it's just the three variables in this case, just to demonstrate, is basically equal to the sum of the expected values of each random variable. That's rule number one to keep in mind. Rule number two, if you have a function, a linear function, b times x, b being a constant, plug in a number, three, four, five, b can take any value. The expected value of that function is basically equal to b, taken out of the x bracket times expected value of x. Why do you think expected value of b is b? What, what do you think is the rationale behind it? Expected value, so look at the third rule which is being applied there. <coughs> yes, go on. Is it because if we... Uh, uh, it can only take one possible... Exactly, one? it's constant, it's not random. Three is three, it's not random, isn't it? It's, it's not something that we don't know. Uh, it's not a variable. It's yeah. constant. If it was, it was a variable like y, x, z that can take any value, then that will be ex equaling to mu x, yeah? So keep that in mind in the exam. This is a bit tricky part. So expected value of any constant, b, c, d, a letter usually is uh, alphabetical letter, uh, is basically a constant itself, yeah? That's the second rule. Now, Given this, can you work out what the, uh, the answer to this question? What's the expected value of this function? Try, give it a try. Three rules. All of them are being applied here in this exercise. By the way, don't rush, think. You know, they have a room called Thinker here. You can go there if you want <laughs> and spend some time with a philosopher. Become a philosopher for a day. Got it? Yeah. Nice. We'll test it in a minute and then you'll see if it's correct what you got. So you you have all rules being applied in this just single example. Yeah, should I reveal the answer? Yeah? Let's test. Best answer? Last line. Yeah? So uh, this is the rule number one. This whole thing is rule number one. Then that directly is the rule number three, that thing. And this is because of uh, rule number two. Expected value of constant times a random variable is actually constant times the expected value for random variable. Yeah? Easy? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Now that we are familiarized, uh, we, are, we are familiar with the uh, uh, expected value, which is the population mean of a random variable. Usually, random variables have dispersions, especially if you're dealing with uh, prob dis uh, probability distribution of uh, random variables. You know what dis dispersion is? 
spread. They have variances, yeah, isn't it? Uh, then the uh, population variance of a random variable is is conceptually defined as the expected value of a random variable x minus the population mean squared. What we're looking at is the deviation of this x from its mean. That's a dispersion, isn't it? So dispersion is basically usually of a distribution is the is the uh, the distance between a value and the mean that this x takes. So in this case, if you if you expand this bracket using the, uh, the ideas that we have just so far defined, a value. So this random variable takes values x one. Remember, the random variable takes small capitals. These are the realizations. So this random variable takes a value x1, x2, x3, x1, up to xn, yeah? So what we do is we just take that x1, take away the mean of this random variable. Whatever the result is, we square them so that we don't end up having a negative value because they cancel each other and then you could get it. You know? So we just do that. Times the probability of getting that x1. Plus x2 minus the mu squared times the probability of getting the x2. So in this case, it's the roll of dice, the, the sum of the two dice rolls. Yeah? So on so forth gives us exactly the same outcome as we had before, the sum over n values of x deviated, deviations, deviation of each one from the mean squared times pi. Is this formally intuitive to you? If not, then the next example just clarifies it. As it is, is, is it in intuitive? Yeah. You know, don't be quiet. I told you, you have to be friends with me. <laughs> Speak like a friend. So I am, you see, I, I don't hesitate asking questions, sometimes personal questions. If you don't want to answer, that's fine. But I treat you like a friend. So if I make a mistake, you have to bring it up and tell me this is that. Because, you know, brain malfunctions here and there, then you have to tell me. And if you don't, obviously, you just get, you won't be able to learn it. And I may misspell something, tell you something wrong, while back of mind, something else is there. But anyway, so tell me now if, you, if, you're not, if it's not clear to you. Uh, these are, in any case, recorded, so you'll be able to watch it later. Right, so let's demonstrate this with an example then. Look what we did. As usual, we have our realizations of random variable, the outcomes from our roll of roll dice, the sum of values, then their associated probabilities, so the two occurs once out of 36 times. So 1 over 36 gives us the probability of obtaining a 2 in, in a row of dice. 3 occurs twice, so the twi two time, 2 over 36 gives us the probability of getting 3. So on and so forth. So these are associated probabilities of each of the realizations. Yeah. If I had the die, I would, I would test it with you. And so 7 has the highest probability of occurrence. That's why it's a mode, and that's why it's average as well, isn't it? In my next row, there's a high probability of getting 7 in my next row. Yeah, that's average. That's that. Then I calculate the deviations of each of these from mean. So xi minus the mean, so that's minus 5, that's xi, remember, this is that xi minus mean was, so what, what was the mean? 7, yeah? Average value for the probability was 7, for the probability distribution was 7, so 2 minus 7, 3 minus 7, 4 minus 7, 5 minus 7, 6 minus 7 gives us this column. Then we square them, each one, mm -hmm. and I'm having 0 here because I'm using 7 minus 7, mean minus mean. Then times them by the associated probabilities, which is that times that, this times that, this times that, 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 that. that's our variance. What's variance now? It's a dispersion, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So on, on a roll of die, I could get uh, 7 plus minus 5. The value can be up to 5, or up to 12, or can be up to, down to uh, 2. Remember the thing, the values? Can take 2 to 12. Mm -hmm. That's a dispersion. This dispersion just tells me the maximum, the minimum around the mean. Make sense to you? What the dispersion is? If you go out for a for a shopping in the Tottenham Court Road, there is electronic shops, right? Yeah. Plenty of them. Not, not, not no, I guess there are few now. Ten yes. years ago when I was working right there as a student, I was working part-time in, in the shop there. Plenty of them and I could go every week 
ask the prices of laptops and see which one I want to buy. For a year I did this. Now I calculated the average price, I plug the distribution then. So it turns out that uh, if I ask the prices, each one quotes me a different price for the same range of laptops. For example, one is 500, one shop says 510, another it gives me a deal and 409, next one 495, and so on and so forth. It goes on a range of values from 480 to 520. That's the range. The mean of it was 500. So it turns out that any any shop, if I randomly enter, with a, let's say with a dispersion of two, uh, 20, if I enter any shop randomly now, in the following year, I could expect average price to be about 500 plus minus 20. Yeah, the 20 is our variance. Yeah, that's the dispersion of my prices. So that's the intuitive explanation of what the range is and the mean is. That's what we are dealing with here as well. Expected values of population and and then the population mean and, and the variance, yeah? So I generalized it now, after a year of surveying, I generalized that this model was going to cost me, when I was a student, it was going to cost me that much with the plus minus. So that's my generalization from that sample of Tottenham Court Road stuff into a whole population. And next time I go to another shop, I probably expect the same price, plus minus 20 pounds, from the end of London, for example, yeah? So, but why is it then... 5.83, why isn't Because that's 7 plus 5.83, that's more than 12. Yeah, we usually take the standard deviation. We don't deal with variances. Yeah, okay. yeah this, this, this is going to be low. I'm just giving you an example of what dispersion is with the, with, the, with the standard variance. But we don't usually interpret the... Yeah, whenever you deal with a standard... Uh, sorry, dispersion, you're looking at uh, standard deviation, yeah. not variance, yeah? yeah? Good question, however. Yeah, it's going to be 12 something, isn't it? So we are not going to uh, deal with this. It looks like uh, the variance is small in this case. Small, if you take a square root, it's what, about 2 point something, isn't it? 2.4. Yeah, 5. So 7 is the mean, 2 point whatever it is, is the va uh, standard deviation. That's what we deal with in this exercise. It's just variance as an example at the moment. So next is now uh, what we call the standard deviation, which is the topic. Population variance is usually denoted as sigma square of x, sub x, I should say. x is a random variable. The dispersion uh, in terms of variance is a sigma square sub x here. And the taking a square root gives us sigma x. Yeah? Very often, from next week onwards, we will be dealing with sigma x in both of them, especially when we are deriving the estimated form. Euler's estimate, and I hope to get this to work as well so that I don't have to move back and forth. This is, I, I got this laptop today only from the admin from the, from the university where I work, and I managed to install the software, but it turned out that this doesn't work on this, so we have to reduce the sensitivity. Right, quite often we will be using this formulation, so you look, look, back, look back what we have. This was the standard, uh, sorry, variance of x, yeah? This was the formulation, this was the expected uh, variance of x, the formula for variance. Mm -hmm. But we deal actually with this. So the variance of x, random x, is expected value of x squared minus the mu of population of x squared, yeah? And there's a proof how, we, how this is done. And it teaches teach us how, how we apply the rules as well. So look at this. Um, to bring this formula, this original formula, we just figured out down to this. Start with expanding the bracket, square bracket. So you have x squared minus 2 mu x, just like a plus b squared, bracket open. So you just apply the same principle here, plus the mu squared. Makes sense here? It's nothing rocket science here. Then variance rule, remember? Sum of expected value of sum of the random variables is basically is the sum of each one's expected value. So that's, we apply expectations operated by opening the bracket on each of these. So expected value of x squared plus expected value of minus two, which is the constant, mu x plus the last bit here, is expected value of mu squared. Notice there, the next line tells us that we took two mu minus two mu out of the bracket. Why? Why not just two? Just mu is a constant. It's a constant, isn't it? It's an average number. Whatever it is, it's an average number. So, you take that out. Yeah. 
in this case, the only uh, the random variable is x, which then retains its expectations operator because we don't know what the realization of it is. So we keep that as it is. Minus 2 mu x vector of x plus mu squared. Notice that earlier we worked out that expected value of x is actually mu. Yeah, if you go back. Population mean. Expected value of a random of x is usually the population mean. So, we go further. So, the rule is a rule, so keep that in mind in the exam or in, in anywhere you're dealing with econometrics. Here it is. So, that's 2 mu times another mu, which gives us a mu square now. So, expected value of a random variable squared minus 2 mu squared plus mu square. That gives us that exact thing. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is anyone planning to do PhD? I didn't plan to do PhD, honestly. <laughs> I had a job offer, was about to start a month later, after master's. As to, I told you that I did very badly in, in, my, in my undergraduate course. I did well in towards the end, not in the beginning. I was lazy in the beginning, I ended up you know, accumulating low marks, too many low marks. In the end, the average ended up being just in uh, somewhere in the in the merit. How do you they mark here? You you guys get a UK system marking, yeah? Merit distinction. Oh, sorry, yeah. two one two two, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was on two one somewhere lower two one. So that wasn't a good for job hunting. So I had to do masters. I did masters in accounting and finance, and I I, I worked harder in that one, realizing that I this is my last chance. I don't want to spend another. At the time, nine thousand. So, ended up being a, having a seventy-two, which is a distinction then. And I had the job. What I wanted was there. But then, then I was offered a scholarship to the PhD. It was a, it was something that happened in the last, last minute. And I was start to start. I was about to start four weeks later. The job that I accepted. And uh, talking to my parents, I I decided to go with PhD scholarship, and spend the next six years. Just working, delaying the PhD. <laughs> Usually it's four years maximum you get, but I did it for six years. Some, my own supervisor did it in ten years, because once you are in education, you teach to live, to survive. So, so I kept teaching rather than doing work, working on my PhD. Anyway, so it's another destination for you if you want, another choice, if you don't want to, do, uh, to go into industry. Because education, for example, in this in universities, you get paid very well, per hour. Lump sum is low. The lump sum you get every year is low. Double, it's, it's double, uh, half to what you get in a bank, usually. But if you calculate the hourly rate, it's mm -hmm. more or less the same. Because you don't work as much hours as the bankers do. They spend time from 8 to 12 sometimes in the evening, in at night, and divide, add them up 360 days, oh, sorry, three, whatever the days that you work. Divide your salary by that amount of hours you work. You get certain number of amount of money per hour. That's your productivity. Then do the same thing with the lecturer's salary. Exactly the same. Because lecturers don't work every day. They teach two modules every week. That's three hours a week. Each six hours. You have 36 hours in a week of working time. Then you have the office hours. God knows if the student comes or not. So you just spend time doing whatever you want. And I'm here teaching that because I have spare time at Pre-Mary, so there's not much. I, I'm teaching only two modules there. That's Monday, that's Tuesdays and Fridays, and a big gap in between. So I decided to come and teach. And that pushes up your earnings. So that's some destination for you guys, if you want to do PhD. And, and the PhD is not only for educators. You can be a banker. Yeah, with a PhD, you can be a better paid banker even than the masters or the other one. And in this country, you can have a scholarship easily if you do very well in your masters. And I did that, I didn't have to pay anything. For my six years, it was free. But I was under pressure because you cannot delay using the resources. You know, you cannot really utilize the resources for six years. It's only four years. It's, my, uh, it's turning my life, just made it easy for me to, to get to that. Okay, that's a life experience if you want to 
consider for you, for yourself and reflect on it. Now, we should, as we said, this is a random variable, is random, it's unpredictable, right? Its values are unpredictable. Then it must have an unpredictable component then. If it has a mean value, which is the fixed component, which is predictable in that sense, it's a fixed value, but there must be another component of random variable that causes it to be fluctuating, yeah? So we think of random variable as composed of a fixed value or fixed uh, component and uh, a random component. In that case, xi or this random variable will be equal to a fixed component, which is its mean, population mean, plus a ui, which is a, a fluctuating value. So the variance of then the random variable is, is not the variance of that, because this is constant. It's the variance of ui. Yeah? This is something to reflect on, but we don't need it. We don't need to look at it. We can, this is the proof as well here. It turns out the, uh, the variance of uh, x, random variable. Remember sigma squared x is a, vari a variance of a sigma uh, x, yeah? yeah. Of a random. Turns out to be the, uh, this value here, being the ui squared. So it all depends on the, the mean of u squared. So the random variable's variance is actually u, 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 u squared. We actually don't come to this point, but this is just to tell you that random variable is called random variable for a reason, and that's because random variable has a fixed component and a, a random component, a purely random component, yeah? A random variable takes a value which jumps around its mean. A value, any random variable takes a value that jumps around a constant mean. So that constant mean is the mu, the, uh, the difference between the random val variables itself and the mu is actually a ui. So we, we won't be dealing with it in the future, but keep that in mind. So you see this i equal. So the, the sigma square of u is expected value u squared, and sigma x square is also expected value u squared. So the logical conclusion here is that random variable has a variance, which is the mean of u squared, the mean of the, uh, the uh, noise, mean of the noise. Uh, I need to draw it. Stay here, stay there, I don't want to come back, but just to tell you, think of a random variable, think of a random variable, just to give you a graph, I think this is easier to tell you, to explain, because we will be using this in the future. Say we have, This is draw. We're drawing some numbers. This is our random variable x. In our first row, second row, n rows. So in our first row from a let's say jar of jar of marbles with number plates on them, we pick them, numbers stay we keep we pick a, a, a value is picked. That's here. That value, xi, say x1. We pick the next number, next thing. That value is x2. So the, this is capital X, these are the small caps. These are the realizations of x. These are the values that x can take. Take another one. We get x3. Somewhere here, somewhere there. We're taking, we're just drawing various numbers, some odd outliers, something like that. So this random variable looks like takes any value with a fixed mean, which let's say, if you put a line, a value x i and this is also this is also the mu x and the distance between the two is our u the noise part so the variance that we have for random variable x which is our sigma squared x is actually the variance of that u it turns out u squared yeah it's the, the deviations are the, are, are the errors. They are the causing, they are causing the variation in our distribution of x, x, capital X, random variable. Makes sense, guys? Yeah. So this random variable takes a value x. If you, if you, if you, if you put a straight line, that makes it clear that the var x, the mu is constant. And the, the, the random variable is basically jumping around that x value, basically fluctuating around that x value, yeah? Clear? 
the idea behind it. We will come to this one, exactly the same thing, but we do with, uh, with the betas, calculated estimated betas next week, or maybe the following week even. So these are actually used, which are the stochastic bars. They, you know, they are deviating from the mean. And for that reason, for this deviation, we have a variance in the random variable. And that variance is actually the variance of these two, these, these values, these. Okay, so one. Oops. Now, coming to continuous variables, so we are coming to the bottom of this lecture. You see this uh, continu uh, random, uh, random. Uh, this great random variable has a probability distribution, and we are able to calculate the probabilities associated with each value, right, easily. And for each one of them, we have single value, and we can calculate the probabilities by just uh, 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 taking the frequency of that value occurring and dividing by the total frequency or total outcome. That gives us the probabilities. But with the continuous variables, which are more often encountered in econometrics, and we deal actually mostly with continuous variables, inflation rate, GDP, anything that can be measured in, with the measurable units or measurement units. So GDP is measured in pounds, yeah? Um, inflation rate is measured in percentages uh, or many other variables that you have in economics are actually continuous variables and since we're dealing with them we have to define something called continuous variable now continuous random variable now now continuous random variables do not take a single value it's very hard to come up with a single value uh, temperature as i said can be a 57 fahrenheit but then it's a rounded up value that we we understand but in fact the temperature can be a long long number like this one here yeah, it can be infinitely small. The probability of it is infinitely small, but the value can be, you know, it's a, like a long one. And finding a probability for that one using continuous variable, it is not that easy. We usually get a very meager, very small amount of probability value for that one. So uh, this will be clear once we. I'll show you the. Uh, I'll show you the example. This is an example of a uniform distribution. On the y-axis, you have the density. Now, not anymore probability curve or probability distribution. It's density now because we're dealing with continuous variables. The height is basically the probability density. On the x-axis, you have the x's for temperature. That takes values between 55 and 75. This is in Fahrenheit. Now, we cannot usually measure the uh, probability of a certain temperature. We cannot say, I cannot really say, if I were to go by the book language, I cannot say what's the probability of uh, a temperature being 55 Fahrenheit tomorrow. I, cannot. I can only deal with probabilities of continuous variables uh, taking a value range of values. I can say, however, what's the probability that tomorrow's weather will be and the, the temperature will be between 55 and 56 only. That's what I can say. So unlike, unlike our probability ran, uh, discrete random variable probability distribution, where I can say, what's the probability of getting 7? You say 6 over 36, one, one sixth, yeah? But here, with the continuous variables, that, can, that definition doesn't work. We have, we have to define a range of values that the uh, random variable takes and find the probability afterwards. And in this case, because it's a uniform distribution, that means every single value here has exactly the same uh, probability of occurrence. Occurrence of uh, or, or having a, a, a weather uh, temperature tomorrow between 70 and 75 degrees is basically uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So there's a 5% chance of the weather uh, temperature of being uh, between 50, 70 and 75, and there's also 5% of chance of that happening as well. That makes sense, guys? Yeah? So this is uniform distribution. Now, the probability that the weather will be as between 75 and 100 is zero. That can happen in reality as well, right? In Arctic, you don't get that high temperatures. So if somebody asks you what's the probability that the, 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 the weather the temperature in Arctic is, is 100 degrees is, is zero, yeah? 
but there's a small probability that it could be up to 75, let's say. Yeah? And in this particular distribution, we have exactly the same probability, just for demonstration. But usually, these are expressed as normal distributions. And I'll show you what it is in a minute. And the same in every single unit range. The values are the same. The probability per unit of interval is basically 0 0.05. It's the area under this curve. It's the area of the rectangle is basically 0 0.05. Right. So, in the in the probability dis uh, uh, discrete random variable probability distribution, what we did was uh, we had the uh, uh, probabilities calculated using the frequencies. Here, it's slightly different. We have to use a calculus method. Uh, integrals. Uh, how good are you with integrals? <coughs> You've done it, right? So the area, in, in here you can calculate it easily, the probability of, uh, uh, usually we don't calculate the probability as, as we calculated it in, in, in the discrete random variable case. We calculate the density, uh, probability density the function. So that's fx. Function of random variable x is our probability density function is equal to 0 0.05 for the, for the range 55 to 75. So the probability of uh, whether temperature being anywhere between 55 and 75 is basically 0 0.05. Beyond it, here or there, or outside this range, the probability is zero. So they are in, in the world, in the globe, wherever you go, there are places where the temperature doesn't go below 55, let's say, or it doesn't go above 75. So the probability is zero for these areas to have a temperature of these sort of extremes. It's always average. Yeah, what's the probability of uh, having a minus 20 in, in London. Usually we look at empirical data, and if they have one or two days of that thing, we take that day, divided by number of days that were different uh, or in the past since that time, yeah? And that will be probably very, very close to zero, right? So that would fall somewhere here or somewhere there. It's the same here, yeah? The idea of probabilities is basically to, to, get, this, to get a sense of what the average weather temperature is. Yeah, given these values. So that's our continuous random variable. Now this is a bit abstract. Let's look at a more a general one. There's a lot of write, written, writing here. I'll use this. This is a probability density curve uh, for, again, let's say again, for temperature in a city. Look at this. This function is a line, a yeah, linear function. Let me, let me bring it up. Here's the function for this probability density curve, 1.5 minus 0 0.08, 2 times x. What's that? This is your linear function, right? It crosses the y-axis, fx, at 1.5. So if you continue this, it crosses somewhere here, which is above 1, yeah? 1.5, that's your b, minus c, which is our gradient, times the random variable x. And this function, the density function, is defined between 65 and 75. So it takes non-zero values between 65 and 75. And outside this range, it takes zero. This dash, uh, the bold line, tells us that probability is a zero line on the zero line outside this range. So fx is zero. Now, it makes sense because some, for someone living in London, um, as the having an extreme with a uh, temperature of 74 is has a very low probability value, right? While in London we can have something like this, and so there's a high probability of that. So this is more sensible than the other one, where probability is very exactly the same. Every single temperature had, well, a range of temperature had uh, had equal probability of happening. But here, with this line, we have a sensible sort of temperature distribution, probability distribution. Now, let's. So this is just describing you what the general function of this specific function. Now, here's a question to you. Can you calculate, please, how would you calculate, for example, the probability of um, temperature falling between 65 and 70, given the density function, from your statistics class, yeah? And then evaluate it 
Okay. Between that range, yeah? yeah? Is everyone happy with that explanation? Mm -hmm. Now, if you think it's difficult, what you can do is uh, create a, this, uh, you can take the, uh, split the function for the area. Remember, the probability is under, with the continuous random variables, the probability is usually the area under the curve between certain specific ranges. So it's the area here in gray. So what you can do is either use what he just mentioned, the calculus method, or take this square times this by that height, gives us area here, and then find the area of this right rectangle. Right angle rectangle. What's this then? Height times the base divided by two. The sum of the two should be uh, I think it was 0 to 0.5. So this is the probability of the weather temperature being between 65 and 70. We need this because hypothesis testing, in hypothesis we deal with continuous, uh, continuous random variables very, very often. Almost every day, you will see every lecture will be based, hypothesis testing is actually based on continuous variables. Uh, con uh, continuous uh, distribution of a continuous random variable, whatever the variable we're looking at. Any question on this? I'll call it a day today in this at this moment, and I'll probably record some videos for you to watch before you come to the next class. Now, can you please install the R yeah. and R mm -hmm. Studio? Yeah. Watch the video on getting started, and we get started next week with a bit of. And summation operator. Yes, and summation operator, by the way. Thank you. So, 9 to 10 is a seminar time? Yeah, what should happen for the settlement? Oh, you don't have to do anything. That's on Thursdays? We will, we will do it in the class. Yeah, don't... We'll, um, so, just for next class, just... Uh, watch the videos, the read the chapter, where will we and find watch them? other videos that I'm going to upload. Come here. Which, where will we find the other videos? Oh, that will be in the Moodle. I'll upload them. Okay. I'll upload them uh, this week. So, do it on Wednesday, so that you have fresh mind the following morning. Yeah, whatever you do, but then prepare this R and R studio earliest, because that's yeah. a mechanical aspect. But doing the reading will help, if you could read. I'm not discouraging you from reading, but if you open the first chapter, you will see that you don't want to read. <laughs> so, take a look. Uh, could I ask Mariana? So, the Moodle page? Uh, if, they, if they allow, yes, why not? Um, are you officially enrolled on the program and then you are supposed to be here? Or is it just your choice? You decided how way through that you want to do economics? Yeah. What? I'm doing economics, but I'm doing only macroeconomics. Okay, so you are not uh, in the list of students who are... I guess I can't do it. Like, I couldn't come here. Ah, okay. You want to be casual. I would like to Can do it as much as I can. Then speak to her. And I, I probably don't know how to do the... Uh, I don't have to do the attendance for you, right? Yeah, that's no, fine. No, you don't have to. Yeah, that's fine. You can, you can do whatever yeah, you want. Not sit in the you class don't. or anything. Yeah, as much you as don't. Can. Then you can come anytime and have a look at it and register with it anytime. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.